Hey guys, Tyler here. Star Trek Lower Decks, created by Mike McMahon, is the tenth series to be set in the Star Trek universe, and the first animated Trek since the animated series in the 1970s. A half-hour adult comedy produced in association with Titmouse Inc., Lower Decks focuses on the support crew of one of Starfleet's least important ships. The show is set in the Next Generation era, specifically the early 2380s, and takes place aboard the California-class USS Cerritos. Lower Decks has been somewhat divisive among fans, as I'll discuss in this video. But to be honest, I don't think that Lower Decks gets the respect that it deserves from a lot of the fandom. Also, you might wonder, why am I talking about this show right now? Well, even though I've reviewed Lower Decks episodes on my live streams, I still don't have a dedicated video analyzing any portion of its lore. Well, besides my criminally underviewed video about Devon Attendee. In short, since as of the recording and release of this video, we're in between seasons four and five, I think certain aspects of the show have come full circle enough that I want to offer more detailed thoughts on the series as a whole. And like my other Star Trek retrospectives, I'll catalog Lower Deck's contributions to the overall lore of the universe. Let's get started. Hey guys, Tyler here from the intro again. You'll be seeing a lot of me throughout this video given this is, well, my f***ing channel. Before we go any further, no, no, wait, wait. This is not what you think. This is not a sponsored segment. This may be overkill too, but I feel the need to issue a disclaimer. Many of you watching this know that I have certain feelings about a certain character, and as an experiment, I'd like to see how far I can push YouTube censors. This video is going to have profanity. It's going to have sexual innuendo. Hide your children. Hide your grandma. Hide your dog. Wait, what? I know that some of you are parents who watch my videos with your kids, and I really appreciate that, but maybe for this one, go tell them to play in the other room. Up to you. Lower Decks isn't for kids anyway. Oh yeah, and this video will contain spoilers, so if that's something you care about, you've been warned. Seems like I say that in every single retrospective video I put out these days, and yet still a fraction of y'all don't fucking listen, so again, there will be spoilers. With that, Let's actually get started. For some background about the series, I'll relay some information I shared in my Tindy video before diving even deeper. A longtime Star Trek fan, Lower Decks creator Mike McMahon, has written for shows such as Rick and Morty and wrote the Short Treks episode, The Escape Artist. He is also the creator of the TNG Season 8 Twitter account, which for a long time posted satirical outlines for a fictitious eighth season of TNG. These outlines eventually led to the commissioning of a reference book called Star Trek The Next Generation, Warped, which transformed those outlines into a fully-fledged episode guide. One of these episodes, seemingly a spiritual successor to the real Season 7 episode, Lower Decks, focuses on low-ranking Enterprise crew members. In 2018, McMahon was brought in by executives at Alex Kurtzman's production company, Secret Hideout, to pitch an animated Star Trek show. Eventually, the show was picked up by CBS All Access, now Paramount+. Plus. In January 2019, Kurtzman said that the series would not be Rick and Morty in the world of Star Trek, Trek, but would have its own tone that still nevertheless skewed slightly adult. McMahon wanted the show to be a celebration of past Trek rather than punching down, and did not want the Easter eggs to distract from the emotional storytelling on screen. Star Trek author David Mack was brought in as a canon consultant, and the practice of characters occasionally mentioning the titles of past episodes was justified by explaining Starfleet mission logs could be given similar titles in-universe. Indeed, the series finale of Star Trek Enterprise, These Are the Voyages, already established that, more or less, the characters in Star Trek watch Star Trek in the form of holo programs. There's a lot about These Are the Voyages that people would love to forget, but 
this explanation is at least consistent, I'll give him that. After Alex Kurtzman stated in June 2019 that Lower Decks would mostly focus on new characters, with the possibility of some legacy characters showing up, McMahon announced the main voice cast. Actress, comedian, and musician Tawny Newsom, previously known for starring in the Netflix comedy Space Force and other shows, was cast as Ensign Beckett Mariner. It's a miracle I got the job because I had no idea that uh, Mariner was such a big part. I literally thought she was like a sidekick. It wasn't until the table read. Actor Jack Quaid, son of Meg Ryan and Dennis Quaid, and previously known for The Hunger Games and The Boys, was cast as Ensign Brad Boimler. I originally auditioned for Ransom, out of all people, which is hilarious now <laughs> at this point. Then they were like, okay, come in for this other character. So I thought like, okay, I missed out on that character. They're gonna kind of relegate me to one of the side characters or, or, or something. But once I got to the table read, I'm like, my chair's in the center. What's going on? Actress, writer, director, and musician Noelle Wells, previously known for roles in shows such as Master of None, Craig of the Creek, and a brief stint on Saturday Night Live, was cast as Orion Ensign Devon Tendi. I auditioned for one role, and then they gave me sides for Tendi, and it was a lot of science dialogue and I uh -huh. looked at it once and I then did the read and I nailed it like in a way that didn't make any sense and then they're like that was incredible can you do it again and then I tried and nothing came out right <laughs> so, so I was like I hope you recorded that first one I got a call when I got it and you know what was even more exciting is that when they announced it my debate teacher from high school contacted me. The only other thing he's ever contacted me about was when I got cast on SNL, and he was more excited about this. An actor, writer, and comedian, Eugene Cordero, previously known for his roles in comedies such as Other Space and Tacoma FD, was cast as Ensign Samantha Rutherford. I was, I was nervous, but, you know, I was just like, oh, I'm just gonna try to do it the best that I can, and, you know, and a vibe that feels right. And so, uh, you know, I did the read. They had notes for me. They wanted me to do it faster. And, and these are all the words that I didn't know. And they're like, can you, can you, like, you know, quicken that up? I'm like, quicken what up? Rounding out the main cast were the bridge crew, or as McMahon put it, the people who believe that the show is about them but it's not. Actress Don Lewis, best known for her role on the sitcom A Different World, was cast as Captain Carol Freeman. Jerry O'Connell, known for his roles in Stand By Me and the show Sliders, was cast as First Officer Jack Ransom. Voice actor Fred Tadashore, known for voicing characters in various Marvel and DC media, was cast as Bajoran Security Chief Lieutenant Shax. And actress, comedian, and screenwriter Jillian Vigman, known for her starring role in the comedy Sons and daughters and frequent appearances on Mad TV was cast as Cation Chief Medical Officer Dr. Ta'ana. Okay, I'm gonna be honest, I haven't actually heard of half of these shows. Initially, some actors such as Newsom and Quaid were recorded together, but this stopped during the COVID-19 pandemic, when recording was largely shifted remotely to actors' houses. Voiceover work for each episode is recorded before any animation work is done, and the different recordings are edited together into what is described as an old-timey radio play version of the episode. Titmouse then takes these recordings and storyboards black and white animation Cinematics, which provide a basis for the animators to add in full details and colors. McMahon wanted the animation style to be reflective of primetime animated comedies he grew up with, like The Simpsons and Futurama. Hey, I also grew up with Futurama. But he also wanted the backgrounds to be more detailed than is traditional in primetime animation. The show's design team tried to follow the same rules as a live-action show and watched episodes of TNG to make sure the environments were consistent with the late 24th century. The California class was designed as a TNG-era version of the USS Reliant from Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan, and the Elkar's computer displays were adapted from the ones designed by Michael Okuda for TNG. Lower Deck's uniform style, which we see is not used throughout the entire fleet, is also based on an unused design for the film Star Trek Generations. The first episode of Lower Decks, Second Contact, naturally gives us lots of insight into various aspects of the show we'll soon become more intimately familiar with. One of the most prominent is the concept of Second Contact, an official encounter between representatives from two governments 
following first contact. Second contact is deemed to be of at least some importance, facilitating continued communication and finalization of important administrative documents. The Cerritos specializes in such missions, making her a prime exemplar of the California class's status as support ships. We first see this mission through the eyes of Brad Boimler, a command division ensign on the Cerritos. Boimler's central ambition throughout the show is his desire to impress his superior officers and increase his chances of one day attaining the rank of captain. Contrast this with fellow Lower Decker Beckett Mariner, who we quickly learn has a history of demotion and has served on five ships. We also meet Tendi on the character's first day on the Cerritos. Tendi is the first Orion Starfleet officer from the Prime Universe to be featured in Star Trek, a fact that will color many of her interactions with other officers and members of her own species. But from the get-go, Tendi exhibits an optimistic attitude that will be present throughout the series. The third we find Samantha Rutherford in a corridor, and we see that he has a cybernetic implant. He's prepping for a date with a trill named Barnes. But as this episode demonstrates, the two of them don't exactly have the best chemistry. Wow, I wasn't expecting that. What did you expect? For these maintenance hatch doors to recognize our comm badges. Second Contact quickly establishes another major aspect of the show that subverts the typical formula of most Star Trek shows, in the sense that the senior staff is, again, not the central focus of the story. We do, of course, become familiar over the course of the series with the likes of Freeman, Ransom, Shax, and Ta'ana. This week's Second Contact mission is with the pig-like Gallardonians, and Boimler has a feeling Mariner will find some way to screw it up, but as it turns out, she just wants to provide some equipment to poor farmers and has to do it off the record, rather than waiting for bureaucrats. Boimler and Mariner's different approaches to completing the mission demonstrate the strengths and weaknesses of both going by the book and taking matters into one's own hands, which is honestly reflective of the different approaches taken by different captains in the previous series. Mariner does fancy herself to be a Kirk type, you know? I've seen some people complain that Mariner's insubordinate behavior, which can get pretty severe sometimes, is kind of off-putting for a Starfleet officer and thus a major hindrance to them enjoying the show. My response would be that, well, I understand where this viewpoint is coming from, but that's also kind of the point of the show. This is not the Enterprise. They're not sending their best. <laughs> <laughs> These are not Starfleet's best, and the Cerritos is one of the least important ships in the fleet. But something I want to stress throughout this video is that knowing the direction that these characters' arcs go in, seeing these early episodes for the second time kind of enhances them and just makes me appreciate a lot more how much potential these folks have. Case in point, by getting stuck in the mouth of a giant spider creature, Boimler helps the senior staff figure out the spider's goo can be used to synthesize a cure for a rage virus that is infecting the crew. In Freeman's log, she distinctly fails to give Boimler credit for his role in saving the ship, which will be a recurring motif in the first season, as I'll elaborate on in a bit. Oh yeah, by the way, Mariner is Freeman's daughter. That'll come up later, too. The first few episodes of Lower Decks succeed, I think, in establishing the basic formula of the show and setting its tone. Lower Decks episodes are somewhat known for being jam-packed full of Trek references. Member berries, as they're called. For some people, these references work, for others, not so much. And by work, I, I don't necessarily mean whether or not you understand the reference, because obviously a lot of these are put in for the super fans. But while McMahon strove for the Easter eggs not to distract from the emotional storytelling, one of my criticisms of Lower Decks is that sometimes they do. This is a problem that plagues a lot of modern media, but I want to stress that for as many member berries as Lower Decks does drop, Honestly, season one does it a lot less than I originally remember. Sure, when the characters encounter a situation that one of the Enterprise crews encountered and somebody says, wow, it's just like the 2260s, I, I do cringe a little bit. But not all of Lower Deck's references are like this. Sometimes they demonstrate an aspect of the Star Trek universe that I think is worth highlighting. Anyway, let's move on to somebody even more important. Perhaps the most important person in Starfleet history, Chief Miles O'Brien. He was more than a hero. He was a union man.
the senior staff's failure to give credit to the Lower Deckers is also accompanied by a couple running gags that further illustrate the disdain towards the Cerritos' junior officers. In particular, I find quite amusing the recurring infantilization of Boimler. You wanted to see me, Captain? It took the eyes of a child to see what we were blind to today, Boimler. Whoever second contacted them wasn't our ship. What a mystery! Uh, whose boy is this? Something else that I only noticed on rewatch is that season one also kind of has a tendency to make Tindy the fall guy in certain situations. For instance, in Second Contact, she's spewed with black goo by an infected crew member. I was actually supposed to be assisting Nurse Westlake. That is Nurse Westlake! <laughs> wow, it's such an honor to meet you, sir. I'm looking forward to working with you. And in Moist Vessel, she becomes obsessed with another crew member's spiritual ascension after she accidentally messes it up in a classic physical comedy bit. Moist Vessel also introduces a recurring concept that, in the Star Trek universe, people near death see a smiling koala, a whimsical expansion of Trek's previous dabbles with the supernatural. Overall, though, while I do think there is plenty to criticize about Lower Deck's joke delivery, Season 1 establishes quite a lot of stuff that I like. Episode 2, Envoys, depicts how easy it is to switch between departments on a starship. We've seen this before, such as with Sulu's transfer from Sciences to Command in the original series, and LaForge's transfer from Flight Control to Engineering in TNG, among others. But it's a nice example of how human institutions in Star Trek have some flexibility to allow people to actually pursue their passions, rather than being stuck in dead-end jobs for life. My heart's in engineering. I'd like permission to leave the bear pack. Rutherford, that is outstanding! Gotta be true to yourself! Of course, not everybody wants to better themselves and do things that will help them advance organically and rank. Mariner's history of insubordination has landed her on the Cerritos under her mom's supervision as her last chance, and the early tension between Freeman and Mariner is one of the more compelling arcs of the series. Moist Vessel even sees Freeman have a little fun with this by planning the ultimate payback after Mariner continues to disrespect authority, even making her do holodeck waste removal. I've got her emptying out of the holodeck's filter! Ugh, people really use it for that? Oh yeah, it's mostly that. Told ya. While I definitely can see how Mariner's behavior can be off-putting to some core Trek fans, once again, having the full context of her characterization in the subsequent three seasons, on rewatch, it all starts to fall into place. You'll see. After Moist Vessel, the fifth and sixth episodes of season one don't really do it as much for me. Cupid's Aaron Arrow does have some humorous twists, but otherwise I don't really have as much to say about it. And Terminal Provocations introduces another character I'm not the biggest fan of, which is Badgie, an AI assistance tool programmed by Rutherford who goes rogue and tries to kill his creator. Badgie shows up in subsequent episodes, but I have to say the concept of an AI that looks like a Starfleet com badge is a little too on the nose for my taste. That said, Jack McBrayer gives his all to the performance. Fun I'm gonna rip your eyes out! And the ethics of AI notwithstanding, Rutherford's reasoning for creating Badgie is totally understandable. I'm sorry I yelled at you, son. I was just trying to impress Tendi. I mean, look at her! She's so cute! I'm also not a big fan of the character Fletcher, whose pure cowardice and ineptitude makes Mariner look like the most ideal Starfleet officer imaginable. The final four episodes of season one, however, are much more memorable. In Much Ado About Boimler, our purple-haired ensign falls victim to a transporter accident that materializes him just slightly out of phase with our reality. Of course, for the crew, the worst part is the sound. All right, Boimler's back, baby. It's time to kiss some visiting butt. Wait, I'm still all phasey. Yeah, but you're not making the sound anymore, which was the worst part, right? Not wanting to live out the rest of his life as a shiny boy, Boimler accepts a trip to the not-at-all-ominous-sounding Federation retreat called The Farm, where Starfleet's freaks are pampered and treated so they can return to normal. Boimler is accompanied by Tindy and her genetically engineered creation called The Dog, who's definitely a normal dog. Oh, 
God, not a normal dog. Wake me up if it turns into something I need to care about. While Freeman, Ransom, and Shax are on a chain of command style Black Ops mission, command of the Cerritos is transferred to Captain Ramsey, an academy friend of Mariner's who is also put off by her haphazard approach to everything. Wait, you knew she could talk and walk? Yeah, of course she can talk. She's a dog. Normal dogs don't do any of that stuff. They don't? Wait, but normal dogs hover and spit lightning, right? No, none of that. Oh. Episode 8 of Season 1, Veritas, is one of my favorite episodes of Season 1. I think it's perfectly paced. I just happened to rewatch Episodes 7 and 8 on a random weekend with friend of the channel Kenzie K, and I kind of forgot how well the jokes landed for me. <laughs> in a grand illustration of how the junior officers are kept in the dark about the details of many missions, our lead four believe they are being put on trial about a recent classified mission in Romulan territory. In four seemingly unrelated testimonies that weave together at the end, the four lower deckers recount how the Cerritos crew was tasked with obtaining a map of the neutral zone, stealing a bird of prey from a Vulcan museum, and infiltrating the Romulan homeworld World to rescue a political prisoner named Klar. It turns out this isn't a trial. It's a party to celebrate Klar's successful rescue. Unfortunately, the bridge crew's refusal to loop in the junior officers has ruined the celebration. You ruined my party! You ruined my party! You ruined my party! You ruined my party! Freeman promises to keep the crew more informed, but of course, this can only go so far because, you know, stuff's classified. If I were to pick any episode of Lower Decks to get somebody hooked on the show and I didn't pick the first episode, I might pick this one. It's almost a comedy of errors. Freeman's statement that there are no wrong answers in a high-stakes situation backfires. We, uh, okay, we could do uh, evasive maneuver 88. Is he f you serious? That was the wrong answer! I'm in 84. In this situation? We see both how helpful and intrusive Rutherford's implant can be. Gordon Wedding! Ah, get me out of here, implant! Ah! <laughs> nice try, Gordon! And Tindy's excitement to clean the conference room pays off in one of the funniest ways imaginable. I had just been given a major assignment. Mariner, Mariner, guess what? I get to tie to the conference rooms. <laughs> what should I wear? Oh, probably just my uniform, right? You must be the cleaner. Yes, sir, and happy to be here. Glad to have you. This mission is highly classified. From here on out, you're a and Wow. Check out this map. It's going to lead us straight into the neutral zone. Do your thing! What's my thing? I have a thing! What's my thing? Ah! 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 Oh! I thought she was just supposed to get us out of here! She was! I do not know what's going on here. This is crazy. Package is safely on board, and there's no indication that the Rom Yulin High Council detected us. Yeah! 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 <laughs> Too bad we have to deny this ever happened, because you were awesome. <laughs> you! You're f***ing crazy! Episode 9, Crisis Point, is the first in the Crisis Point saga, an in-universe hollow movie programmed by Mariner, actually using Boimler's code. A way for Mariner to work out some of her issues with her mom, the program is jam-packed with references to, in particular, the TOS movies, like the extended Cerritos docking sequence, a callback to the playfully named Starship porn sequence in the motion picture. It even has some deep cuts, like showing static between the nacelles of the ship when it's about to jump to warp. However, the other characters are somewhat disturbed by Mariner's thirst for violence, and in particular, her implementation of Orion's stereotypes that make Tindy very uncomfortable. She calls out Mariner in a rather memorable scene that also foreshadows something about her past. Dude, Orions are pirates! Pillaging your whole thing! Okay, stop! It is not my whole thing, and for your information, many Orions haven't been pirates for over five years! That said, the program does turn out to be therapeutic for Mariner, whose erratic relationship with her mother will gradually improve over the course of the series. Things are complicated when the crew finds out that Freeman and Mariner are related, and at times it does present itself as a potential liability. But as they say, time heals all wounds. Get off my mom, you bitch! Get away from her, you bitch! Also, for those of you out there who are following the meme, I cannot exactly remember the specific moment in season one that, shall we say, 
sexually awakened me to this green queen, other than her nerdy personality that was evident from day one, but it was probably this episode. In the season one finale, No Small Parts, one of the central through lines of Lower Decks is put front and center. Case in point, the Cerritos is assigned to follow up with a civilization on Beta 3, first visited by the Enterprise crew in The Return of the Archons. Somewhat to Starfleet's surprise, the Betans have resumed worshipping their computer overlord, Landru, and this ordeal has a lasting impression on Freeman and the crew. Starfleet's failure to follow up with newly contacted civilizations comes back to bite them in the ass even harder when we find out that the Packleds, who seemed like a joke of a species in the TNG episode that introduced them, Samaritan Snare, have become more powerful than ever by acquiring even more advanced technology. The B-plot sees Tindy act as the liaison for an exocomp Starfleet ensign who has constructed what she calls a mathematically perfect name. Peanut Hamper. Much like Badgie, I'm not really a big fan of this character who I find more annoying than anything. I joined Starfleet to piss off my dad. Why? But you could say that she has a mathematically perfect redemption later on. In a confrontation towards the end of the episode, the OSS Titan, under the command of William Riker, assists the Cerritos in defeating the Packleds for now, but they'll be back. Unfortunately, Starfleet's victory comes at the cost of Shaxx's life and a year of Rutherford's memories, but Tindy takes this a little differently than you might expect. <sighs> you know what this means, right? We get to become best friends! Okie dokie! Boimler uses the Titan's intervention to get what he's always wanted, a promotion and a transfer to a more elite ship, much to Mariner's disappointment. Of course, this perceived betrayal is overshadowed by the revelation that Starfleet has a new genuine threat on the horizon. As Mariner opines towards the end of the episode, Starfleet is good at observing, but bad at maintaining. As Rowan J. Coleman pointed out in his excellent video, Is Humanity Good? The Philosophy of Star Trek, the franchise has often shied away from suggesting changes to in-universe power structures. I always point to this diegetic critique of Starfleet as a perfect illustration of Mariner's anti-establishment archetype, which, as I've said before, is quite welcome in the 2020s. All of this is why I kind of think Lower Decks has more to add to the conversation than the other modern Trek shows, believe it or not. Something I'll expound upon later. After I make my video, you can make the worst Star Trek video on YouTube. <laughs> Responding to Kenzie yeah. K? <laughs> my, my response. My response. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. A measured response. A measured response. <laughs> Before we go any further, a word from today's sponsor, Architects of Fate. Hey, are you looking to build an adventure with friends? Well, I just might have the place for you. Architects of Fate is a Twitch channel that specializes in tabletop RPGs with an emphasis on interactive gameplay and storytelling, all for free. Just by jumping into chat, you can make the lives of the game master and players easier or harder. It's up to you. Not only do Architects of Fate play well-known tabletop RPGs like 5th edition D&D, but they also play less common RPGs like Star Trek, Star Wars, Conan, Aliens, and more. Plus totally original games like Solar Patrol and Bad Horses Evil League of Evil with the two-headed DM. Architects of Fate even has community game nights with chat. They're always looking for new games to share with each other and invite you to play alongside them. The goal is to make sure every viewer and player gets their chance to contribute and shine. If you like Lower Decks, I strongly encourage you to check out Cookie Trek. In this fan-favorite Architects series, players, hosts, and chat work together every Friday to craft original stories with all of Trek lore in play and an attitude of Make It So to keep the story moving. Started in early 2019 by Chief Architect Nat Too Shabby, Architects of Fate continues his family's tradition of tabletop gaming and late night storytelling by sharing the experience with everyone. So come watch and join a group of players to write new stories and forge new friendships. Architects of Fate can be watched live on Twitch or rewatched on YouTube at the links on screen and in the description below. Big thanks to Architects of Fate for sponsoring this video. Now, back to Lower Decks. Season 2 of Lower Decks in some ways offers up more of the same, but this isn't totally a bad thing. 
In a mission that later comes to be regarded as rather iconic, Ransom is infected by some strange energy that imbues him with godlike powers, even exceeding those of Gary Mitchell. Rutherford tries to start over with Barnes and actually gets much further than he did the last time, but Tindy, remembering how things between Rutherford and Barnes previously ended, is convinced something is wrong with Rutherford's brain. She rather obsessively tries to diagnose him with a neurological disease before relenting and revealing a major insecurity of hers, actually one that was revealed in Moist Vessel, that she cannot stand the thought that someone doesn't like her. And you know what? I agree. Seriously though, Rutherford convinces her that just because he's not acting exactly the way he did before his injury, he could never dislike her. Tindy apologizes, although she does sort of undercut it by saying, Also, don't do burns. Naturally, this does open the door for Tindy and Rutherford's relationship to deepen even further later down the road, which we get teases about in subsequent seasons. Speaking of relationships, Strange Energies marks the first on-screen spoken appearance of Andorian crew member Jennifer Shireon, whom Mariner will begin to date at the end of season two. But they've both got a ways to go before they get there, and in fact, kind of hate each other at first. Actually, to be more accurate, Mariner hates Jennifer, but according to Jennifer, <laughs> I don't think about you at all. Yeah, right, I bet you dream about me every night with your stupid little butt. It would say, how should I say the sh prefix, sh apostrophe, the sh prefix? How should I pronounce that, do you think? Like, sh, the sh, the, the sh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Fuck, I've only seen the it written. <laughs> the sh prefix. <laughs> I think it's the sh, the sh, like a hot, like a, like a harsh, the sh prefix. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Fun fact, the sh prefix in Jennifer's last name, Shireon, indicates she is a shin, one of the four Endorian genders, according to the naming conventions established in the Star Trek novel continuity. She's a trans icon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. God, your fans are going to be like, no, she is not. <laughs> Get out of here with that woke bolt! <laughs> Episode 2, Kayshawn, His Eyes Open, introduces the character Kayshawn, a member of a species called the Temerians, whom we first met in the TNG episode Darmok. The first Temerian in Starfleet, Kayshawn's speech mixes both Federation Standard English, thanks to an updated Universal Translator, with both old and new Temerian phrases. The Lower Deckers have been assigned to an away mission with Ensign Jet Manhaver, who totally cucked Boimler and Cupid. <laughs> who totally cucked Boimler in Cupid's Air and Arrow, and has had Boimler's bunk and shift duties while he's on the Titan, which is more intense than Boimler thought it was going to be. Notably, on Kayshawn's first mission, he's turned into a puppet by a beam of energy after saving Tindy from being hit. Thank you for your service. <laughs> Thank you for your service. Mariner gets pissed after Rutherford and Tindy go along with Manhaver's less risky escape plan, but they're forced to get creative when complications arise. We see the skeleton of Spock 2 from the animated series episode The Infinite Vulcan, one of numerous nods to TAS peppered throughout Lower Decks, and in another nod to prior Trek, when a Titan away team is trapped in another situation, Boimler hatches a plan to save his comrades that inadvertently results in the creation of a transporter clone. One of these fellows assumes the name of William Boimler and elects to stay on the Titan, forcing the original Boimler back to the Cerritos. While some might regard this as a forced reference to the TNG episode Second Chances, on the contrary, William's creation actually becomes rather consequential later on. And throughout the season, Mariner continues to give Boimler hell for leaving her without saying goodbye, a grudge she'll continue to hold for a while. Aw, look at this little guy. I could use him as puppet therapy. Hey, yeah. make limo! Read the sign! The third episode, We'll Always Have Tom Paris, is a rich lore dump that also contains some great character moments and big reveals about certain characters' pasts. Tom Paris visits the ship, much to Boimler's excitement, although their first meeting doesn't exactly go as planned. Tom Paris! Okay, on! Tom Paris, can I just say that I'm a really huge fan and I'm yeah. for you! Shax is also back, something that bothers Rutherford far more than it does the other characters, given Rutherford feels he's responsible for Shax's death. As Mariner puts it though, Bridge officers are always coming back from the dead. You gonna finish that muffin? But Rutherford has to know how. He quickly comes to realize, however, that broaching the subject is extremely sensitive. Shax is back? Didn't you die? How the heck did you come back to life? <gasps> oh. 
Lieutenant Junior Grade Cody, that is out of line! Because in Star Trek, once you cross that threshold of death, you encounter unspeakable horrors that no man should have to face. Forget about the koala. According to Shax, after death, the soul goes to the Black Mountain, a spiritual battleground where they must fight three faceless apparitions of their father, and the surviving father makes them eat their heart. This story scares Rutherford straight, and he'll definitely never be the same man again. Meanwhile, Mariner accompanies Tindy on a mission to retrieve a family heirloom for Dr. Ta'ana from Quaylor 2, a Cation libido post. Wait, oh, is that a sex thing? A Cation has to be intimate once a year or their hormones make them crazy. It's like a Vulcan on Ponfar. <laughs> oh, oh, look at these claw marks. They're like from her horny great-grandma. Hey, Dandy, my name is Jeremy. I'm an important cultural sex toy from the past. Please <laughs> deliver me to Dr. Ta'ana so I... I can't believe you're touching it! Oh my god, I'm touching it with my bare hands! Unfortunately, the post breaks, and the two whose quest to get it fixed takes them all over the map. As we come to find out, Ta'ana just wanted the box. Isn't that racist towards Cations? <laughs> <laughs> but before this, Mariner and Tindy's escapades uncover some other insights about each other. Tindy doesn't realize that Mariner previously served on Deep Space Nine, or that the Cerritos isn't her first assignment, much to Mariner's chagrin since, as she points out, she talks about her previous postings all the time. On the other hand, Mariner continues to demonstrate her own ignorance about Tindy, with Mariner not even knowing Tindy's first name. We have been working together for over a year, Beckett! Well, now you're just showing off. The episode is also an early confirmation that Tindy does not possess the pheromones commonly associated with Orion women, a fact teased in season one. In Orion, she will use her pheromones to cheat us! <gasps> oh, that is such a messed up thing to say! But, like, could you, you know, just, like, juice it a bit? Just a little? <gasps> Mariner! Of course! Not, not even that kind of Orion! And we also learn that Tindy's title in the Orion Syndicate was the Mistress of the Winter Constellations. After uncovering an illegal Mugato poaching operation by the Ferengi in Episode 4, the Cerritos crew hosts a diplomatic contingent of the Duplers, a species that involuntarily duplicates as a self-defense mechanism when embarrassed. Unsurprisingly, after overhearing Captain Freeman complain about having to walk on eggshells all week, the Dupler diplomat splits resulting in a cascade effect that threatens to overrun the whole ship. The first time I watched this episode, I kind of found the whole storyline to be a little bit too goofy for my taste, because unfortunately the duplers cross into annoying territory for me. This was still somewhat true on rewatch, but the highlight of the episode is the B story. Actually, no. That was the B story. The A story follows Boimler and Mariner's efforts to get into a legendary Starfleet party on Starbase 25, where Boimler intends to hobnob with some captains. He figures that his transporter clone William will probably be on the guest list, but after realizing the Titan is farther away than the Cerritos, Boimler plans to pose as William with Mariner as his plus one. After entering a shop on the Starbase, they're held at gunpoint by a Miserian, angry at Mariner for stranding him on SETI Alpha 4. The Miserian agrees to give them the location of the party if they transport some merchandise for him, but it turns out the cargo contains stolen Klingon disruptors, resulting in an epic chase sequence involving Starbase security. After crashing into an aviary, Mariner and Boimler lose security. Mariner is refused entry at the party, which is DJed by Thaddea Nakona, and among the guests is Captain Elizabeth Shelby. Fun fact, Shelby's first officer resembles the original design for the Kelpian species. After Boimler feels guilty for being there without Mariner, he ditches the party and apologizes about the Titan, clarifying that he was afraid she'd talk him out of the promotion he was so proud of. The two enjoy their time in a bar where Kirk and Spock drank over a century prior. The the sixth episode of Season 2, The Spy Humongous, advances the ongoing Packled storyline. We actually get to see their homeworld, which they call Packled Planet. Ugh. After a Packled spy blows his cover, Freeman tricks him into revealing the Packled's entire plan, which involved them smuggling a Veruvian bomb onto Earth. I have to say that even though I'm, I know that a cartoon is going to exaggerate and play up certain things, Something about the Packled's portrayal in Lower Decks has always just felt a bit off to me. In Samaritan Snare, their apparent stupidity functioned largely as a cover for them to ensnare, see what I did there, other species into traps. In Lower Decks, the Packled's are pretty much just stupid all around. 
Of course, in Samaritan's Snare, Jordy and Riker were able to outsmart them by making up a powerful weapon called a Crimson Force Field. Either way, it kind of leaves open the question of how exactly the Packlids have gotten as far as they have. <laughs> I ultimately think that there's a lot more going on with them than meets the eye. Is it a universal translator thing? Perhaps they had a once powerful civilization that has since collapsed into virtual anarchy. Who knows? By the way, this episode has a number of other callbacks to previous Trek entries. Such as Kazinti Ensign Taylor demonstrating poor posture, emulating the Kazinti telepath from the animated series episode, The Slaver Weapon. And at the end, the gang uses an alien artifact to prank call Armus from the TNG episode, Skin of Evil. You look like a big bag of crap! Who said that? The subsequent entry, Where Pleasant Fountains Lie, gives us a rare insight into the past of Commander Andy Billups, who is played by actor, comedian, filmmaker, and podcaster Paul Shear, known for starring in Black Monday and The League. Even though I actually just know him from 30 Rock. Billups is the Cerritos' chief engineer and was born on the planet Hysperia, colonized by a group of humans who practice a medieval fantasy-themed lifestyle. By joining Starfleet, Billups had abdicated his birthright to the throne as prince. When Hysperian cruiser carrying Billups' mother, Queen Paolana, experiences engine trouble, the Hysperians seek Billups' and the Cerritos' engineering expertise to fix it. As it turns out, however, this is all a ruse to get Billups to lose his virginity, which under Hyperion law would automatically make him a king. Meanwhile, Mariner and Boimler are stranded after a shuttle crash on an uninhabited planet. They are carrying a sentient computer, Agamus, to the Daystrom Institute after Agamus has manipulated the population of another planet into a century-long war. Agamus, played by the one and only Jeffrey Combs, who needs no introduction, is a much more entertaining AI for me than the previous ones that have been featured on the show, and he'll be back for more or later. After a Pandronian consultant named Shari Yen Yem visits the Cerritos and makes the crew undergo holographic drills, one of which includes the voice of Alice Kriega as the Borg Queen, we arrive at what is perhaps the best episode of the entire series so far, Wedge Dooge. Wet Wedge Dudge. I don't fucking speak Klingon. You had some thoughts on that. I literally had to look it up. <laughs> yeah. He's like, what is this? Well, we, we sent me a Snapchat. It was like, what, what, but, what, what is this? What am I looking at? Like, I can't read this. <laughs> like, sorry, but I'm not a Klingon. <laughs> I don't know. Klingonese for three ships. Wedge Dooge is the first Lower Decks episode to be nominated for a Hugo Award, and is another perfect showcase of how Lower Decks subverts the traditional Trek formula. As part of his never-ending quest to butt-kiss his way to the top, Boimler tries to find a bridge buddy during a long warp trip on the Cerritos. I just asked if you learned how to throw pots on Bajor. No, 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 no. Oh, do we not talk about Bajor? Ah! Don't think I have time for anything other than resisting! Fighting fascism is a full-time job! During this downtime, we get rare glimpses into the lower decks of a couple other ships, a Vulcan science cruiser called the Cheval, and a Klingon bird of prey called the Cheta. Cheta. I, I, I said I don't fucking speak Klingon. On the Cheval, a junior officer named Talin, played by actress Gabrielle Ruiz, best known for Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, forgoes her duty of monitoring tertiary impulse systems and enhances the long-range sensors with algorithms she's developed. This leads to the detection of a particle surge in another star system, and Talin has a gut feeling that this is worth checking out. But Talin is criticized by her fellow officers for not sticking to her assigned task. Asks. Talin takes her findings to the captain, who orders the helm to change course and investigate. But he warns this is not an endorsement of Talin's outbursts, and he compares her behavior to that of a child. On the Chita, an officer named Ma'a seeks to impress his captain, Dorg, and become the new first officer. He learns that Dorg is the one who's been arming the Packleds. After Dorg is told by the Packleds that they've detonated their only Veruvian bomb in a test on an asteroid, the Cerritos drops out of warp just in time for a firefight with both ships. The Cheval shows up to assist, and Delin's presence at the battle later comes as a surprise to Mariner. Ma'a mutinies and helps fend off the Packleds, who retreat. Later, Talin's captain recommends her transfer to a star fleet vessel. We'll be seeing more of her later on. Live long and prosper, sir. 
In the season finale, the Lower Deckers are on the edge when, after overhearing conversations among senior officers, they fear there's about to be a slew of reassignments. Mariner overhears Captain Sonia Gomez, whom we first saw as a young ensign in the TNG episode Q Who, talking to Freeman about a potential command offer, and Tindy thinks Dr. Ta'ana is going to fire her from her medical duties. Rutherford's cybernetic implant also starts to act up, which we find out is because he's been saving three backups of all his memories of Tindy since the accident, and his storage is getting full. He reluctantly purges the backups, but witnesses a memory he thinks he wasn't supposed to see. The Cerritos crew must save Gomez's ship, the Archimedes, from crashing into a newly warp-capable planet after the Archimedes is hit by a solar flare. The Cerritos jettisons its outer hull plating to navigate through a dangerous debris field, but one last panel has to be released manually from the inside. Boimler volunteers to dive down a hydro tube in Cetacean Ops that connects to the panel and releases it. After the Cerritos saves the Archimedes and makes first contact with the Laperians, Ta'ana calls Tindy into her office and tells her she's not firing her, she's recommending her for senior science officer training. Wait, like, to work on the bridge? Like, Jadzia Dax? Who the f*** is that? I don't know who that is. No, like Spock. Amidst the celebration, however, Freeman gets some troubling news. She turns down what she thinks is her promotion, wanting to stay on the Cerritos, but in fact, she's put in handcuffs and arrested for the destruction of pac -Led Planet. Things are getting real, y'all, and it honestly calls for a change of scenery. Alright, cut. I think that's good for tonight. Let's go get some pizza. Oh, oh Devana. Oh. <sighs> Let's get started. I'm gonna beat a bunch of different games. And by beat a bunch of different games, I mean win a bunch of online solo games. What's up, guys? Good morning, sweetheart. It's about time, man. All right, let's get started. Tell you what, man, I cannot believe that not only are you sexually attracted to a goddamn cartoon character, or that you paid $60 for a cardboard cutout of it, but that you're up here night and day smooching on it. Or that you had to buy another one after you couldn't get that stain out. Yeah, it's like that episode of Spongebob where they was painting Mr. Krabs' house, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. <sighs> what can I say? Tindy might not have the pheromones, but she still brings me to my knees. Listen, man, you can joke about it all you want, but it's still super weird. Come on, lighten the fuck up, will ya? It's harmless. It's, it's for the meme. Is it really a meme anymore, though? Not to mention the fact that we are talking about a non-human animal here. I mean, that's bestiality. And where I come from, that is punishable with prison time. What do you mean where you come from? I created both of you in a lab. <laughs> it's what the lamestream liberal media wants us to think, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Besides, I'm more of a Mariner man myself. You might have to compete with Kinsey for that. God, I want her to step on me. <laughs> oh man, it's so good. Uh, okay, okay, okay. That, that's enough. That's enough. We've got to get down to business. We got the rest of the shoot tonight. Is the tindy wall ready? Ready as it'll ever be. <sighs> good work. Good work. All right. Well, you know the shoot's slated for five thirty, so that should leave plenty of time to finish setting up. What else have we got today, guys? Oh, let's see. We're still loading and optimizing the footage from yesterday. We're working on promotional materials for the next gaming stream. And we're keeping tabs on those anomalous readings from that stellar gas cloud in the Centaurus arm. Sounds good. Keep, keep me updated, all right? <sighs> oh, by the way, we're, we're going to Hardy's for breakfast. You want to come? <sighs> nah, I'm, I'm good. I've got some stuff i got to finish up here. <sighs> all right. Have fun in your dungeon of perversion. J just let me have this one thing. Check. 
Season 3 of Lower Decks marks a gradual shift towards more episodes with just A stories, starting with the season premiere, Grounded. As Freeman's Tribunal proceeds on Earth, Mariner enlists the help of Boimler, Rutherford, and Tindy to find evidence to exonerate her. We initially see Boimler at his family vineyard in Modesto, California, where they do not make wine, but instead make raisins. And in classic fashion, Boimler rebuffs the advances of the many attractive women who work on his family's property. Want to test the sweetness of my bushel? Oh, fine, Genevieve. <clears throat> Just give it 43 more sun hours at 21 degrees bricks. Oh. Okay. Before our four leads meet up, Tindy and Rutherford also have a meal at Sisko's Creole Kitchen in New Orleans, owned by Benjamin Sisko's father, Joseph. The group initially plans to transport up to the Cerritos to access Boimler's logs, which can corroborate Freeman's innocence. But a swarm of incandescent verugament migrating through the solar system has created a natural scattering field, which will block any transport attempts off Earth. The only way they can access the Cerritos is from another ship, giving Mariner the idea to steal a replica of Zephram Cochran's Phoenix, the first Earth ship to break the light barrier, from a theme park in Bozeman, Montana. After Starfleet security catches wind of the Lower Deckers' unauthorized commandeering of the Cerritos, Tindy tells security they're in the middle of a biological survey, which the security team believes after Freeman arrives and says she authorized the survey. Surprised to see their captain, the Lower Deckers learn that Freeman was exonerated after a covert team led by Morgan Bateson uncovered proof that the footage showing Freeman colluding with the Klingons was deepfaked. Mariner's father, Admiral Alonzo, Freeman scolds her for not trusting in the system as they had the truth on their side. Freeman orders Boimler, Tindy, and Rutherford to clean up the hangar, and she assigns Ransom to be Mariner's direct supervisor. She's had just about enough of Mariner's shit. Indeed, this is a recurring storyline throughout season three, that Ransom now has full oversight over Mariner. As far as you're concerned, Mariner, I'm your mama now. On the first mission we see with this new arrangement, in The Least Dangerous Game, Mariner questions how Ransom structures his away team when they're repairing a broken space elevator. Uh, I'm sorry, orbital lift. Ransom sends Rutherford and Billups to the surface of this paradise planet to handle diplomatic negotiations, but things soon go south. After Ransom realizes that Mariner has a point that they belong on the planet and the engineers should be repairing the lift, the two skydive down to the surface, only after Mariner returns tired from an unauthorized skydive of her own. In the B-plot, Boimler decides, upon rather comically misinterpreting advice from Tindy, that he should start saying yes to everything, which lands him in the midst of an alien's hunt. Turns out, though, it's just catch and release. The only casualty is Boimler's shoulder, which will always feel a little off, according to Dr. Ta'ana. Tindy feels partly responsible for Boimler's injury, but he instead hugs her and says he never got nearly as much recognition before becoming Bold Boimler. Her suggestion for moderation goes ignored, and Boimler gets his character killed in the Klingon version of Dungeons & Dragons, featuring a Ferengi knockoff program of Klingon Chancellor Martok. Unfortunately, Gowron is only available in DLC. While Boimler experiments with being bold, Mariner continues to experience personal obstacles of her own. Her relationship with Jennifer deepens this season, with Jennifer inviting Mariner to meet her friends at a salon in Hear All, Trust Nothing. The prospect of this has made Mariner quite nervous, as she was worried if Jennifer's friends didn't like her, Jennifer would break up with her. And indeed, Mariner can sense that, despite attempts at being polite, she won't get along with these gals. But after Jennifer's friends panic during a blackout, Jennifer gives Mariner permission to let loose, and Mariner stuns the other officers so they all consume less oxygen by being unconscious. This episode is important for other reasons too, as it gives more insight into both Shaq's and Tindy's pasts. As the Cerritos docks at Deep Space Nine to assist with trade negotiations with the Karima, we learn that Shaq's knew Kira Nerys and the Bajoran Resistance during the Cardassian occupation, and the two saved each other's lives countless times. Kira is still in command of the station six years after the events of What You Leave Behind. An Orion Starfleet ensign serving on the station named Mesk notices Tindy and starts chatting her up about how few Orions are in Starfleet. 
He boasts about how he defied his family's wishes that he take over the pirate business. And as the three deliver gift pallets to the Karima, Mesk incessantly prods Tendi about pirate-related activities, making her angry. She's still quite embarrassed about her criminal background, but it comes in handy when she must use an Orion multi-tool to help them escape the Karima ship when the Karima kidnap Cork. Cork had stolen Karima technology and marketed it as the Cork 2000, a specialty replicator, leading Freeman to broker an agreement that, in exchange for not going to prison, 76% of Cork's franchise's profits will go to the Karima. Later, Rutherford tells Tindy how impressed he was by her pirating skills, and Tindy promises she'll no longer be embarrassed about her past. While some might view Tindy's backstory as a failure to deconstruct the stereotypes about Orion's being pirates, on the contrary, I think the massive influence that the Syndicate has over Orion society could be used as a future storytelling opportunity to explore why so many Orions are pirates. All in all, a consequential episode, and one that is chock full of DS9 references. Much like season 4 after it, even though we're still in 2381, season 3 is a season of change. For instance, Tendi has officially started senior science officer training, as witnessed in Mining the mind's minds. Tindy is understandably super proud of this accomplishment, given the difficulties she's faced being an Orion in Starfleet. In fact, she takes it so seriously that she's upset when Rutherford goofs off during a hollow movie in which Tindy is in command of a mission, as seen in Crisis Point 2, Paradoxus. He tells her that, of course, she would make a great captain and doesn't need a hollow movie to prove that. Crisis Point 2 Paradoxus is perhaps one of the most densely layered episodes in the entire series so far when it comes to references. The plot of the hollow movie contains callbacks to several Star Trek films. Three Romulan triplets, the antagonists, parallel the Klingon Duras sisters from Star Trek Generations. Mariner's speculation about the movie's time travel plot involving the assassination of John F. Kennedy is a reference to Gene Roddenberry's scrapped initial idea for the sequel to Star Trek The Motion Picture. Funny enough, the Strange New Worlds episode, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, suggests that in a previous iteration of the Star Trek timeline, Prior to interference from the Romulans, JFK's survival helped advance the trajectory of human spaceflight. The crew's stopover at a lab on Europa has many similarities to the Wrath of Khan, the lab itself paralleling Regula 1, and the blonde scientist Dr. Gibson, estranged from Boimler's Captain Dagger character paralleling the relationship between Carol Marcus and James T. Kirk. The sequence also has a Starfleet briefing similar in presentation to that of the Genesis device briefing. The Starship crews must travel back in time to stop the Romulans from damaging the timeline, just as with the Borg and First Contact. And a Romulan bomb design is the same as the Thaleron generator from Star Trek Nemesis. Retrieving an octopus from an aquarium to avert a disaster in the future parallels the retrieval of humpback whales in the voyage home and Boimler and Mariner's side quest contains allusions to the final frontier and the motion picture. This episode also reveals Boimler's transporter clone has in fact had his death faked and is now in the custody of Section 31. Mm, what you say? He asks why the clandestine organization would use a special black comm badge, referencing the agency's open depiction as the official intelligence branch of Starfleet in Star Trek Discovery. Isn't Section 31 supposed to be like a big secret? I mean, why would we wear special comm badges that advertise who we are? You could still be dead. While the first crisis point was instrumentally therapeutic for Mariner, I have to say that I like the second one better. And Boimler's grievance that the big twist of the Hollow movie makes no sense can also be seen as a fun jab at the lackluster ability of AI to imitate human art. Ah! <sighs> Kitty Hawk? Kitty Hawk? That reveal doesn't make any sense! Earlier, Episode 4, Room for Growth, sees the Lower Deckers compete with members of Delta Shift for vacant rooms on an upper deck. 
this little scheme, which of course doesn't go as planned, nevertheless foreshadows the lead's move in season four from sleeping in hallway bunks to having their own rooms. Episode five, Reflections, sees Mariner's conflict over whether she wishes to continue serving in Starfleet be emboldened by independent archeologist Petra Aberdeen, who happens to be situated next to the Starfleet recruitment booth on Tulgana 4. She references the controversy over whether Starfleet is truly a military organization, calling it a pseudo-navy. Despite her initial objections to this characterization, Mariner is nevertheless tempted by Aberdeen's offer to join her. She eventually does after being reassigned by Freeman to the dreaded Starbase 80, Starfleet's filthiest outpost, in trusted sources. This occurs as part of a misunderstanding when a Federation News Network reporter accompanies the Cerritos on her first mission under Project Swing By, proposed by Freeman to avoid future incidents like the one at Beta 3. Their first stop is the now thriving Ornara, last visited by the Enterprise D in Symbiosis, when Picard cut off the Ornarans from their dependency on a drug manufactured by the Breckens. Once we shook the old demons out, we focused on healthy diet and fitness. You could say we're addicted to that now. <laughs> While Freeman seemingly helps uncover a brain presence on Brekka, this is overshadowed by the crew's recounting of several Cerritos mishaps that make it seem like Freeman doesn't have control of her crew. Mariner is the only one who has anything positive to say about her mom, but Freeman thinks Mariner ratted her out. It's only after the FNN story airs that Freeman realizes her mistake. <gasps> Pie-eating contest is canceled? But I've been expanding my GI tract to store more pie! And I perfected dislocating my jaw! Hot. Fuck, I lost my place. Shit. Rutherford also remembers a major aspect of how he got his implant, which is that it was part of a cover-up. The season three finale, The Stars at Night, reveals the broader nature of this cover-up. Using code similar to the one he used to later program Badgie, a young cadet Rutherford was recruited by Admiral Les Buenamigo to create an AI for his pet project, the fully autonomous Texas class. This new ship class is meant to replace the California class, as many at Starfleet believe the latter is archaic, bearing a strong similarity in concept and physical appearance to the M5 Multitronic unit from the original series episode, The Ultimate Computer, the Texas class interface of course goes rogue. After finding out that Space Dock is being attacked, Mariner convinces Aberdeen to join the fight to save Mariner's friends by recruiting the entire California class to help out yet again proving the worth of crewing starships with actual people rather than AI. I'd say this is a pretty good finale, and with Mariner back, this is so far the one and only finale without a major character temporarily leaving the ship. In fact, we actually get a new crew member, Provisional Ensign Talin, officially transferred from the Cheval. Tindy can tell she is going to have a new science bestie. What's that? There was another episode with Peanut Hamper this season? And fuck peanut hamper. I hate peanut hamper so much. <laughs> you know what? Peanut hamper is a stupid name! Things are getting deeper. The characters are learning to open up and be more vulnerable. More vulnerable. Things are getting deeper. The characters are learning to open up and be more vulnerable. And that's fantastic. But while Rutherford and Tindy more or less come to terms with their past lives, Boimler and Mariner still have a little ways to go when it comes to the whole confidence thing. And if you think the development in season three was monumental, just you wait for season four. Season four makes me wanna cut. Before we get into season four, I'd like to kind of pause for a moment and contextualize some things about our discussion so far. When it was first announced that they were doing an animated comedy in the Star Trek universe, I have to say I was a little apprehensive. And I think that some of that apprehension was justified. <laughs> like I said, on my first watch through the just sheer amount of referential humor and particularly the first two seasons was just, a little much for me. I was upset about Badgie, I was upset about Peanut Hamper, and I kind of didn't like that they were saying the exact names of previous Trek episodes. And I think the rapid cartoon pacing was also a lot to take in, given that this is, you know, a Star Trek show. It's different from previous Star Trek in a lot of ways. You know, Star Trek has never really done anything like this before, not on this level. 
Mariner's behavior was kind of off-putting a little bit. She kind of got on my nerves, to be honest, I, I hate to admit, but you know, as will become clear towards the end of this video, seeing how these characters' arcs unfold and going back to the earlier seasons, I kind of find it charming how green they were, no pun intended. Oh, Devana. I also think that my perception was partly colored by the fact that I watched season one in 2020, like a lot of other people, and 2020 was kind of the worst year of my life. <laughs> but in any event, both before and after my rewatch, season four has stuck out as kind of a major turning point in the series. It's in no uncertain terms my favorite season because of the shakeups. The four leads get promoted to Lieutenant Junior Grade, and this actually sparks a recurring internal conflict that is also reflective of how the show is growing up too. Now that they're no longer ensigns, now that they're no longer sleeping in hallways, are they still truly Lower Deckers? Is it the same show that it was in the first three seasons? And is that a good or a bad thing? Well, again, as we're about to talk about, I think the answer to the latter question is, it both is and isn't the same show, but I think that the writing has gotten a lot better. The crew sort of getting their shit together a little bit is, is pure character progression, and I'm really glad that they are including that in the show. As to the first question, well, that's also a yes. They're still lower deckers, but they have more responsibility, and their actions carry more weight. The season four premiere, Two Vicks, I actually consider to be a rather weak start to an otherwise strong season, mainly because of its over-reliance, in my opinion, on trotting out Voyager references. Now, this might sound kind of odd to some of those who have watched the episode because it's about the Cerritos assisting a museum curator to escort the USS Voyager to San Francisco. Much like how Tuvok and Neelix are accidentally merged in the original Tuvix, a transporter accident leads Dr. Ta'ana and Chief Billups to become merged as Ta'illups. How many physical memories do you have from before? The crew discusses how to resolve the situation, but after coming to the realization that Janeway effectively murdered Tuvix, the crew becomes divided. Ironically, this precipitates the crew becoming less divided, literally, as to Ellipse, in an act of self-preservation, starts merging crew members on the Cerritos. Talyn tries to come up with her own solution, but inadvertently makes the situation worse, merging the entire crew into a giant, non-sentient blob of flesh. The interaction between Talyn and Tindy, who agrees to help her, is definitely the highlight of the episode. And in addition to her initial, now sort of iconic, first appearance in Wedge Dudge, I still don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. This episode is an early demonstration of how fantastic an addition to the cast Talyn is. Seeing Talyn just completely fail at saving the crew on her own and saying, High Command will not be impressed with my error. Ruiz's performance is absolute gold, and this is honestly just the tip of the iceberg with how much I absolutely adore Talyn's dialogue this season. Whereas Tindy previously had reservations about splitting a sentient life form against its will, now that Talyn has created this monstrosity, they both agree that it's preferable to return everyone back to normal. The central conflict of this episode, of course, parallels the long-time, often vitriolic debate among fans about whether Janeway did the right thing by splitting Tuvix back into Tuvok and Neelix. I've gone on record several times saying I think that Janeway did nothing wrong since Tuvok and Neelix did not consent to being fused together in the first place, and she was saving two men's lives even if it meant sacrificing one, but I'm sorry, just one who should have never existed. <laughs> it's a bit of a trolley problem, sure, but in the context of Star Trek, I don't really think it's a difficult ethical dilemma. While Rutherford doesn't get promoted at the end of Tuvix, he does earn his extra pip at the end of the next episode, I have no bones, yet I must flee. This episode sees the Cerritos crew assist in the rescue of two humans from an alien zoo, where an away team must hide from the deadly bone-drinking Moopsie. Moopsie. 
It also marks the earnest beginning of one of the most significant arcs of the season, which is perhaps the most extreme streak of insubordination and unnecessary risk-taking by Mariner yet. Prompted by her return to the rank of Lieutenant Junior Grade in a quest to get demoted, she shows up to an away mission completely out of uniform, gets in a bar fight and forces her friend Quimp to take out a predatory loan, exposes herself to deadly creatures without a protective suit to fix a fence, and dies into the middle of a jungle during a glass storm. But beyond her more superficial reasons for engaging in such self-sabotage, we actually come to learn a deeper reason for this behavior that kind of brings her character and in some ways the entire damn show full circle. We'll come back to this in a bit. We spent so much time hanging out, staying up late, ranking captains by cuteness, swapping bodies because of those cosmic rays. <sighs> we learned too much about each other that day. Hold on, I, I, I want to see that episode. Mariner isn't the only one to receive some major character development this season. Now that Boimler has been promoted, he's put in charge of leading an away mission on an alien megastructure. Talyn mentions that statistically, ensigns who serve under recently promoted commanders usually die of death and or dismemberment. Death? Yes, and or dismemberment. Very reassuring. But seriously, Talyn's dialogue in this episode is perfect. While she does reassure Boimler that he needs to give his team space to let them work after he continues to micromanage them, she also offers a stream of typically stoic Vulcan observations that are just the right amount of unhelpful to make them absolute comedy gold. Don't hesitate to come to me or provisional lieutenant junior grade to Lynn, who's on site in case any science stuff happens. Everything that has ever occurred is science stuff. Fascinating. A mountain or possibly a volcano has appeared. Huh, it is a volcano. I don't know what it is, man, but just putting a Vulcan in a comedic setting just fucking works for some reason. Talyn is genuinely one of, if not the, best things to happen to this show. For some reason, a lot of people consider Season 4, Episode 3, In the Cradle of Vexilon to be a rather uninteresting episode. And to be fair, the main plot of giving a software update to a sentient computer isn't the most exciting, but it's definitely an important character development episode for Boims, whose history of ass-kissing in the previous seasons has evolved into an actual knack for leading a team such as when he has to bravely take command of the ship in the season finale. Tindy's past is fleshed out more than ever in season four. In Something Borrowed, Something Green, she is summoned back to Orion for the wedding of her sister to Erica, played by actress Ariel Winter of Modern Family fame. Hoping to gain more knowledge of Orion culture, Mariner and Talyn accompany her on a triple threat girls trip. Upon arrival, Mariner and Talyn find out that Tindy's family is loaded and that they are the fifth wealthiest family in the Orion Syndicate. After the three meet up with Tindy's parents, Devana is tasked with locating to Erica, who appears to have been part of a bridal kidnapping. Apparently, bridal kidnappings are a tradition on Orion, but the timing of this one is suspicious. Brides are only abducted after save the dates and before the invitations. This is far too late. As Tindy and her friends make their way through the mean streets of Orion, Mariner and Talyn notice how much people defer to Tindy. After all, she is the mistress of the Winter Constellations. Let us in. Get in line. Uh, well, mistress of the Winter Constellations? Oh, I didn't realize. Please don't flay me. Oh, he's, he's just kidding. I would never flay. Indeed, seeing Tindy switch effortlessly between her old and new ways of speaking mid-conversation is very entertaining to watch, and also kind of hot. Have I made it clear? Oh, has Starfleet softened you? <laughs> yes, I love being soft. Tindy, how are you so good at the murder bug drinking game? I don't know. It's my first time. Guess I'm just a natural. Their search takes them to a strip club Tindy used to frequent, and Mariner makes an offhand reference to the Enterprise episode Bounty. Tindy's made it clear that Starfleet made those pheromones up. I mean, they had to explain why a captain would get taken out by some Orion showgirls. It's here we get our clearest confirmation so far that not only does Tindy lack the notorious seductive pheromones, but in fact, most Orion women lack them. Finally, they arrive at a ship graveyard where Tindy and her sister used to hang out as kids. 
Tendi talks about how she always had a passion for science and always dreamt of being a Starfleet officer, a life choice her family has long considered a betrayal. She confesses that she was trained from childhood to be a syndicate assassin, something Mariner and Talyn have pretty much figured out by now. De Erica suddenly shows up, having kidnapped herself to lure Devana, and the two Tendis spar before reconciling. Something Borrowed, Something Green is, for obvious reasons, one of my favorite episodes of the season and of the series. And I think it functions perfectly as Tendi's final metaphorical coming out episode. The B story about Boimler and Rutherford using a Mark Twain holodeck program to resolve some roommate disputes is not as engaging, but the gag of Mariner constantly getting stabbed is classic. <laughs> How dare you judge me, Vulcan? <laughs> oh, what are the odds? Are, are you seeing this? Huh? Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha, nope. I'm gonna stand way over here. Fascinating. Derica, please, can we just talk about this? I'll let my blade do the talking. <laughs> oh, come on! Speaking of this coming out metaphor, I want to address something about this character that I've seen in various discussions in my comments section. It should go without saying at this point that Devana Tendi is, no contest, the most popular character from Lower Decks, and there are many reasons for this. Well, besides the obvious, she's the only visibly alien character out of the main four Lower Deckers, until Talyn shows up, and a member of a species first introduced in the original series. Her bubbly, optimistic attitude, the result of both how her character's written and the performance Noelle Wells has crafted, also makes her a perfect mascot of sorts for the Star Trek franchise in the 2020s. That is, even if she's not the most prominent character in most of Lower Decks' marketing, although that's slowly changed changing. In short, Tindy means a lot to a lot of people, myself naturally included. Could you tell? <laughs> but there's a recurring reaction that I've seen over the past few months in particular whenever I talk about Tindy. This comes from a minority of people to be sure, but essentially there is a cadre of fans who think that Tindy is trans, asexual, or both. Not that it matters too much, but I do want to interject my thoughts on this matter given how much of a meme I've made on this channel out of, you know. There is a concept in fiction called coding. That is, that certain characters who are presented a certain way can still otherwise be coded as something else. Very often, this has to do with things like sexuality and gender identity. In this case, the idea is that even though it's never been explicitly stated one way or the other that Tindy is transgender or not, a major aspect of her characterization suggests she is transcoded. Such language has been used to describe Tindy by various fans of the channel. Channel, and I want to make it clear that if this is how you interpret the character, that is absolutely your prerogative. However, I'm not really the biggest fan of this, you know, this coded or that coded thing, because I think that some people mistake that for like actual representation, and it's not. The biggest piece of evidence that Tindy might be trans came early in the show's run with the indications that she doesn't possess the pheromones of other Orion women, playing on the audience's expectation that most do. However, I think that dialogue in Something Borrowed, Something Green more or less puts this theory to bed. Uh, technically, I said that not all Orions control men with pheromones. Some of us definitely do, just not me. <laughs> Although again, the episode does function pretty well metaphorically as a coming out episode. Mariner saying, we know, is of course analogous to parents in countless TV shows and movies telling their gay child, we know and we still love you. So I'm not poo-pooing the metaphor overall, but this this whole like, oh, she's actually trans, but they just haven't revealed it yet. No, no. Think about it, guys. In the 2020s, would a show like this literally hide the gender identity of a major character for four plus seasons? 
they wouldn't. That's not how actual representation works. Obviously, Star Trek as a sci-fi show has, for a long time, engaged in the sort of allegorical representation, like how the DS9 episode Rejoined used the trill taboo of reassociation as a metaphor for homosexuality. But these days, since LGBT acceptance has become more commonplace, representation in the modern Trek shows has been more straightforward. In Discovery, for instance, Paul Stamets and Hugh Culber are the franchise's first openly gay couple as main characters, and the revelation of both Adira and Gray's gender identities comes very early after their introductions onto the show. Besides, we don't know for sure if Orions are even progressive on this issue, although we have seen examples of Orion polyamory in Discovery. If Tindy were trans, I think we'd know by now. Something else I've actually seen more often, believe it or not, in my comments section is the idea that Tindy is asexual. I know I'm, I'm gonna probably piss some people off by saying this, but I'm sorry, this is just totally absurd. This is a clear example of people projecting their head cannons as if they were factual, which I know people are going to do, but if you actually watch the episodes, I I'm sorry, I just don't know how you can come away with this interpretation of the character. The thing is, if you want to say that about Tendi, then you have to say that about Rutherford. Yeah. He's clearly not, like, asexual. No. Yeah. They're just, like... They're just awkward. <laughs> yeah, they're just awkward. Yeah. There are several instances where Tindy displays clear attraction towards others. I, I can do anything. And what a snack. <laughs> oh, oh, pause for a second. I want to talk about Khan and that thick, thick chest, but I gotta pee. Not to mention her clear jealousy at Rutherford dating Barnes, and especially her brief fling with O'Connor in Moist Vessel. Uh, okay, you want to move the goalposts and say that Tindy is aromantic instead? Well, look, this, this is neither. Does this woman look asexual to you? You might think that I'm obsessing a little bit over this issue, but this isn't just about Tindy. This is the same kind of media illiteracy that people rightly criticize conservatives for when they miss the obvious political allegories in Star Trek and other media. If you've held this theory and are upset that I've dismantled it today, all I can say is if you actually watch the show, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Tindy and Rutherford, the ongoing question of will they, won't they is again teased in episode 6, Parth Ferengi's Heart Place. The Lower Deckers are assigned to travel guide duty on Ferenginar, which has applied to join the Federation as part of Grand Nagus Rom's progressive reforms. We learn Starfleet has travel guides for all known habitable planets, so naturally, Mariner is keen to scout out as many bars as she can. It's here where her erratic, out-of-control behavior forces Quimp to bail her out, progressing the arc of Mariner's friends being very concerned about her self-sabotage. And Boimler, striving to visit 40 different locations on the planet, instead becomes stuck in his hotel room on his own volition, watching Ferengi TV shows. You're fired. Slug O'Cola. This happens to everyone who drinks it. <laughs> Much like how Nana Visitor and Armin Shimmerman reprised their roles as Kira and Quark in Season 3, Max Grodinchik and Chase Masterson return as Ram and Lita in this episode. Rom plays up his reputation as a simple-minded fellow to go to Starfleet into giving more concessions under the new trade negotiations. Freeman catches on to this and tries to swindle Rom back, making him proud that she respects Ferengi culture. All the while, Tindy and Rutherford have to pretend to be a couple as part of their travel guide duty, putting them in some awkward situations. Ooh, shameless! Really press yourselves together, publicly display that affection. Do not come. I love being married to my husband. Do not come. What a smack. <laughs> Do not come. You've got this. Do not come. <laughs> Do not come. She's in my pants. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> this episode is rife with meme material and is probably one of the best character-driven installments of the show. And as to the matter of whether the show truly is building up to a Tindy Rutherford romance, I think it could go either way. They're obviously best friends, but 
I think enough seeds have been planted about their mutual attraction that a romance is not out of the question. But as far as inter-crew relationships go, our girl Talyn's discomfort serving with humans is amplified when a Betazoid delegation visits the Cerritos in Empathological Fallacies. When the crew seems to have lost all their inhibitions, the situation is blamed on the Betazoids, who are tested for Xanthi Fever. Xanthi Fever was first featured in the Deep Space Nine episode Fascination, in which Loaxana Troy, while carrying the virus, projects her feelings for Odo onto the rest of the crew. As it turns out, though, the Betazoids are not the culprits. Instead, we learn that Talyn has Bendai Syndrome, which also afflicted Spock's father, Sarek, in The Next Generation. Talyn finds this curious, as Bendai Syndrome usually affects the elderly, whereas she is only 62. Also, 62. You look great, by the way. Having a similar effect to Xanthi Fever, Talyn's emotional distress has been telepathically projected onto the crew. She fears this is because she is not Vulcan enough, and relays the story of her discipline aboard the Cheval to Mariner. Mariner reassures Talyn that she's Vulcan as a motherfucker and her former captain's attitude was the truly illogical one. Taking this reassurance to heart, Talyn's stress levels return to normal, as does the Cerritos crew. This episode, effectively a hybrid of fascination and the TNG episode Sarek, does have a pretty familiar plotline. But like In the Cradle of Vexilon is an important episode for Boimler, and Pathological Fallacies is an important episode for Talyn. Also, it does turn out that the Betazoid delegates were hiding something after all. As agents of the Betazoid Intelligence Agency, they have secretly been tasked with delivering intel about a mysterious ship that has seemingly been destroying alien vessels across the quadrant for the past several weeks. We've seen this pattern play out in the prologues and epilogues of previous Season 4 episodes, but up to now it's still unclear whether these crews are being killed or just transported somewhere. The truth is slowly revealed in the second half of the season, starting with episode 7, A Few Badgies More, which brings back Agamus, Badgie, and Peanut Hamper. After being salvaged from the wreckage of a pack-led clump ship, Badgie takes over a Drukmani vessel and seeks to infiltrate the entire Federation computer network. Rutherford's attempts to reason with Badgie cause him to split into three separate programs, the others being called Guji and Logiki. Logiki suffers a demise, but after Badgie obtains control of the network, he realizes his quest for revenge was pointless and ascends. Meanwhile, Tindy visits the Daystrom Institute for Peanut Hamper's parole hearing, with Agamus helping Peanut Hamper craft a fake testimony. Boimler joins the trip as well to see Agamus, who has vital information about the recent attacks on alien ships. Agamus isn't lying. It's through him that we find out the crews are not being killed, but they're being abducted. Agamus tricks Boimler into letting him escape, and the three travel via shuttlecraft to Ecuador so Agamus can wait for Peanut Hamper. They've been hatching a scheme to take over another planet, but as it turns out, Peanut Hamper really has had a change of heart and now views organics as worthy of respect. She's still going back to prison, though. Out of the three episodes featuring Badgie and Peanut Hamper, this one is definitely my favorite because I actually think it does offer both characters mathematically perfect redemptions, unlike the fake out in season three. Before the epic season four finale, we get another standalone story in episode eight, Caves. After getting trapped in a cave on an away mission, the Lower Deckers come into contact with the ferocious alien slime. They recount the events of previous cave missions to help them pass the time, and also reveal relevant details that can help them escape their current situation. On a prior mission with Steve Levy, Boimler became frustrated with Levy's constant second-guessing of Boimler based on Levy's own conspiracy theory-laden inclinations. We actually met Levy back in Season 1 when he shared such gems as Wolf 359 was an inside job, actually not that far-fetched given Picard was assimilated as Lakitus of Borg, and changelings aren't real, the Dominion War never happened, which is just not true. Levy suspected that Vendorians, first introduced in the animated series episode The Survivor, were behind them getting trapped as part of a morality test. This actually turned out to be the case, much to Boimler's surprise. 
and Levy's. Dialogue in this episode, including a near Freudian slip about how people on subspace forums make up conspiracy theories to make sense of a chaotic universe, indicates to me that Levy probably doesn't actually believe everything he says and may be coping with some trauma he experienced in the past. I actually feel kind of bad for him, to be honest. I, I just want to help. As the Vendorians confirmed, his theories about how they're behind everything are a mixture of fact, exaggeration, and fiction. We did not, as you put it, do the Klingon Civil War. Hmm, <laughs> agree to disagree. Boimler mentions how he and Levy have actually hung out on the holodeck and his friends are incensed by this. Next, Rutherford recounts how he and Dr. Ta'ana got trapped in a cave on Balkus 9, and an alien guide named Thusa, attacked by a non-humanoid Graflax and impaled by a stalagmite, transferred her consciousness via dermal contact into Rutherford's body. He then gave birth to a clone baby, who Ta'ana helped him raise as they looked for a way to escape. After modifying the Universal Translator to interpret the growls of the Graflax, Rutherford and Ta'ana found out that the Graflax was simply guarding her young, and she helps the two find a way out. Again, the Blower Deckers are upset with Rutherford for not previously telling them about his experience, which fans will note is similar to Trip Tucker's in the Enterprise episode, Unexpected. Then, Mariner recounts an away mission in which she bonded with members of Delta Shift after crashing their shuttle in an alien cave, where they discovered Pergium deposits surrounded by mineral veins emitting and chronotons that made them age. It's like the beach that makes you old. Yet again, Mariner's friends feel betrayed that she chanted with Delta Shift, their sworn enemies. As the four are pinned up against the wall by the slime, seemingly near death, the slime demands to hear Tindy's story about the time the four got stuck in a turbo lift, which Mariner has continued to cut off throughout the episode. She then describes how, on her first day on the Cerritos, after dealing with the rage virus, they were stuck in a non-functioning turbo lift for nine hours. Tindy talked about how she feared being hated for being an Orion, but Mariner said she's one of them now. The four, still pinned against the wall in the present, share a laugh in a moment of reminiscence that I think by now, the show has kind of earned. The slime is pleased by the story and explains how it has been lonely for so long. It allows them to keep collecting samples as long as they continue to tell stories. As the episode ends, we find out that all along, this whole experience was itself yet another Vendorian morality test. As I mentioned earlier, Mariner's erratic behavior comes to a head in the two-part season four finale, starting with the inner fight. Get it? Get it? After that whole fence thing, Freeman gathers Boimler, Rutherford, Tindy, and Delenn, and assigns them the job of keeping Mariner distracted on a low-stakes mission while the Cerritos apprehends Nick Locarno. Locarno, whom we first met in the TNG episode, The First Duty, was kicked out of Starfleet Academy for attempting to perform an illegal flight maneuver on Commencement Day, training for which got his friend Joshua Albert killed. Talyn notes that if Mariner comes into contact with Locarno, it could precipitate even more dangerous behavior. Tindy recalls that there's an old space buoy in the nearby Sherville system that has stopped transmitting data, which the four can play up as super dangerous. As it turns out though, danger does lurk in this system. They're being watched by a Klingon bird of prey. The bird of prey attacks and sends the Five's shuttle crashing towards the planet. They discover that they're not alone on the planet, as the commanders of the various alien ships that have been attacked are apparently stranded here too. Meanwhile, the Cerritos travels to New Axton, which is twice as lawless as the old Axton, but without any of the charm. Here, Freeman obtains information about Lacarno's location, though with some hiccups along the way. Who's coming to strength? You heard it again. Tell me who your master is, you fake puppet! He's a that's He's got all sorts of internal organs! Back on Sherbel 5, after taking a rest following hours of searching for a way to rescue themselves, Mariner secretly scouts ahead and comes face to face with Ma'a, who is still alive. The two fight, but then must seek shelter during a glass storm. What follows is, and I, I swear to God I am not trying to be hyperbolic right now, probably one of the most important scenes in the franchise. Yeah, I fucking said it. After Ma'a makes a comment about how much Mariner must hate Starfleet, she says, That's the thing, I 
don't. In a speech that writer Mike McMahon worked on perfecting for over a year, Mariner explains that at Starfleet Academy, she knew a cadet named Cito Jaxa, whom we also saw in The First Duty and was killed by the Cardassians in the TNG Season 7 episode, Lower Decks, McMahon's favorite episode of Star Trek. After Cito's death, Mariner pledged she'd never let herself be put in a situation where she had to send one of her friends to die. Starfleet is supposed to be about puzzling together the mysteries of life, not fighting wars. I don't want to be a general. I don't, I don't want to send my friends off to die. I just want to be an ensign. If it was good enough for Cito, then it's good enough for me. Ma'a calls out Mariner for her selfish behavior and says that Cito died for her freedoms, and Mariner realizes Cito would be ashamed of her. She and Ma'a confront the other alien crews on the planet. Mariner seeks to get everyone to work together to plan an escape, but an Orion captain named Cosmia and her first officer, who looks a lot like Naomi Nagata, refuse to listen. Before Cosmia can attack Mariner, she is stopped by Tindy, who arrives just in time. Cosmia addresses her as the mistress of the Winter Constellations, and Tindy uses her clout to protect her friend. This is my friend. Harming her is an attack on my entire house. God, she's so hot. <laughs> <gasps> the conclusion of this storyline is delivered in the season finale, Old Friends, New Planets. Locarno believes that Mariner can help his cause, given her feelings about Starfleet, and reveals his plan. Locarno seeks to use a Ferengi Genesis device as a bargaining chip against the powers of the Alpha Quadrant, demanding respect of the independent Nova Fleet, a nod to his flight team at the Academy, Nova Squadron. They're part of the first totally independent, unaligned fleet in the Alpha Quadrant. Um, the Maquis would like a word. Mariner thinks Locarno is a maniac. This guy sucks! What? He's an idiot and his plan is stupid. He's gonna get you all killed because he only cares about himself. <laughs> and uses her mom's command codes to commandeer a ship from Nova Fleet and escape with the Genesis device. The only problem, though, is that the fleet is situated inside the Detrion system, which is protected by a Trinar shield designed to be impenetrable. Tindy hatches an idea to deal with this, and against orders, the Cerritos crew tries to solicit the aid of De Erica to borrow an old Orion battleship and ram through the shield. De Erica refuses, explaining that given she's overseeing the merger of the Tendies and her husband's family's criminal enterprises, she can't collude with the Federation right now. But if they leave a message after the beep, uh, wait, Devana, not satisfied with this, then invokes. Bye! After both sides gather in an arena, De Erica explains the rules. Each side picks a champion. If the Cerritos' champion wins, she'll lend them the battleship. But if her champion wins, Freeman must surrender the Cerritos to her. De Erica chooses a towering woman named Beth, and Devana chooses a rather bizarre option, the Cerritos' avian counselor, Dr. Miglimo. While the Cerritos crew thinks they're doomed, Miglimo holds his own after Devana tells him to fluff his down, causing Beth to sneeze uncontrollably. But though it appears they've won, Miglimo, like an absolute asshat, allows himself to be crushed by Beth who was declared the winner. Before Freeman can fully transfer control of the Cerritos to De Erica, Devana intervenes and offers something she knows De Erica wants more, her sister back at her side. Having you back at my side would mean more than some measly support ship. The Cerritos is not measly. She is the gem of the California. Andy, shut up. De Erica accepts the offer and then lends them the battleship, but makes Devana promise she'll honor the offer even if they fail in rescuing Mariner. We won't. In space, Mariner is cornered and arms the Genesis device as a last resort. When Locarno beams over and has her at phaser point, Mariner explains that she might disagree with orders, but still believes in Starfleet's mission, whereas Locarno is just angry that he's had his quote-unquote perfect life stolen from him. The Cerritos, in concert with the battleship, penetrates the Trinar shield and rescues Mariner right as Locarno is about to fire. In his effort to disarm the bomb, Locarno is hit with a paywall, and the device explodes. 
creating a new planet, just like at the end of The Wrath of Khan. Later, Admiral Vassery congratulates Freeman on opening diplomacy with Orion. When the Lower Deckers are reunited, Mariner declares that she's decided to quit self-sabotaging. As they celebrate their victory, Erica's ship shows up, meaning it's time for Devana to leave. She says some tearful goodbyes to her friends, but promises she'll be back. Boimler reassures Rutherford that Tindy is resourceful, and if anyone can find a way out of this arrangement, it's her. And indeed, in the final shot of the entire season, and so far, as of when I'm recording this, and as of when it's being released, the entire series, a determined Tindy says to herself, You've got this. I have to be perfectly honest with you guys and share the story of the day that I watched the finale. I've mentioned this on some of my live streams, but I'll tell the story again. Typically, Lower Decks episodes are released at 2 a.m. on Thursdays in my time zone, so midnight Pacific. Old Friends New Planets premiered in North America on November 2nd, 2023. I was playing golf that day. Yes, go ahead and get your jokes out of the way. In between holes, I was checking some messages in my Discord server, which, if you haven't joined that, by the way, link's in the description. One of my Discord members pinged me and asked me, hey, are, are you okay after last night's episode? <laughs> Immediately, my heart sank and my first thought was, oh no, what happened to Tindy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've internalized the meme that much. I think it's clear. After I got home, I immediately watched the episode, and I have to admit, yes, I was in tears. Mike McMahon has said in interviews that he's especially proud of the last two episodes of this season, and I think he has a right to be. Everyone knocked it out of the park, and Old Friends New Planets legitimately had me on the edge of my seat. And after that cliffhanger, I immediately said to myself, this is legitimately the first time I can say, I cannot wait for the next season of Lower Decks. I've spent a good portion of this video criticizing and critiquing aspects of Lower Decks. I've thrown around admittedly loaded words like cringe and annoying to describe certain characters and certain jokes, but I want to make something perfectly clear. I really do like this show. In fact, I kind of love it. Guys, I think that Lower Decks is creeping towards favorite Star Trek territory for me. Okay, I, I don't think that the writing is objectively on the same level as the best moments of the live action shows, but god damn it, Lower Decks is just fucking fun. Like I said, whereas I was kind of underwhelmed by large swaths of the first two seasons on first watch, again, going back on rewatch and, and knowing the full arcs, these characters, it just made me enjoy the early seasons that much more. I can now see the seeds that have been planted and the potential that these Lower Deckers have to become truly exceptional officers. And speaking of full circle, kudos to Mike McMahon for roping in one of the deepest cuts of all time, Nick fucking Locarno. The season four finale definitely makes you feel like everything in the show has been kind of building up to this. And the suspense of waiting to see what happens with Tindy next season. Not gonna lie, it's been it's been eating me up for quite a while. I, I couldn't stop thinking about it for days after I watched the finale. No, come back! Come back! Funny enough, there's a line of dialogue in Old Friends New Planets that caught my attention. Before Freeman goes to tell Tindy that her sister has arrived, Vassery tells Freeman, There is one last piece of business regarding your lieutenant. I immediately interpreted this as him talking about Tindy, but I later realized that it's left ambiguous on purpose. Either way, I think it's going to become clear in retrospect that Tindy has been given some sort of Starfleet secret ops mission in Orion territory while she's gone. She's coming back. She 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 she's com she's coming back. Yep. It's, it's not cope. <laughs> yeah. She's coming back. She, she's coming back. She's coming back. Am I too emotionally invested in this finale? Maybe. But memes aside, serious for a minute, I actually do think that season four is a strong season of comedic television. And that is in large part thanks to Talyn. The inclusion of a Vulcan character to ground the manic energy of the four main characters is 
such a genius move. And while again, the earlier seasons of the show are better on rewatch, in my opinion, I love that the characters have grown. I'm glad that Mariner seems to be getting past that self-sabotage bullshit because Let's be real, it's not very attractive. It reminds me too much of my ex-girlfriend. Boimler figuring out what kind of captain he wants to be is a welcome development, as is Tindy and Rutherford again coming to terms with their past demons. There is a concept in media discourse called the golden age of television. Many of you have probably heard of it, but in a nutshell, it's a period that's basically marked by a high number of what's considered quality television shows. Named after the original golden age in the 1950s, most definitions stake the beginning of this era in 1999 with the premiere of The Sopranos. Although some definitions include shows of the late 80s and early 90s, like Star Trek The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, and Babylon 5. Lists of Golden Age shows frequently include the likes of The West Wing, 24, Lost, the reimagined Battlestar Galactica, Avatar The Last Airbender, The Walking Dead, Game of Thrones, House of Cards, Orange is the New Black, etc. The period was marked by higher production values than ever before and the rise of creator-driven anti-heroic dramas. But just as there's uncertainty over when the most recent Golden Age began, there's also an ongoing debate as to when exactly the Golden Age ended. Most consider it to have started waning by the mid-2010s with the series finales of shows like Breaking Bad and Mad Men, with others marking the 2022 finale of Better Call Saul and the 2023 Hollywood labor disputes as the final nails in the coffin. Whereas the 2000s and early 2010s were still dominated by a rather homogenous cable and network distribution environment, the rise of streaming services in the late 2010s and early 2020s has marked a shift towards well, frankly, quantity over quality and oversaturation. Now, many speak of the golden age of television in the past tense. When doing research for another project, I came across a May 2023 essay by Caitlin Greenidge in, of all things, the women's fashion magazine Harper's Bazaar. Don't ask. I I I'm just kidding. It, it, was, it was on Wikipedia. Called, It's Time to Embrace the Era of Mid-Entertainment. Heavily paraphrasing and simplifying here, Greenidge basically characterizes the 2020s as the age of mid-television. And you know, obviously, <laughs> I think a lot of us could probably agree that this applies to movies as well. Noting that these days, rather mediocre programs are gaining popularity due to the escapism they provide in a time when the real world is bringing ever more anxiety. Now, she, she doesn't specifically cite Lower Decks in that article because, let's be real, unfortunately, the viewer base for this show is not very high. But the thesis of this essay kind of reminded me of the mixed critical reviews that Lower Decks Season 1 garnered both on Metacritic and Rotten Tomatoes, compared with the sentiment of Lower Decks fans that it's frankly competitive for the title of best Star Trek show of the 21st century. After my rewatch for this video, I have to say I think it's competitive for that title as well. But this led me to ask myself, what is Lower Deck's purpose? Being that it's an animated comedy set in the Star Trek universe, I actually think it's kind of difficult and maybe even a bit unfair to compare it directly to the live action shows. Why? Well, to put it bluntly, it's a different genre. Most Star Trek is family-friendly dramatic television with occasional light-hearted moments, whereas Lower Decks is an animated adult comedy with occasional dark and serious moments. And as my good friend Kenzie K and I recently discussed, it's also clearly targeted at a different audience, but it also has elements that veteran Trek fans will enjoy. Regardless, outside some episodes of Strange New Worlds with decent enough political allegories, I think Lower Decks is the Trek that has the most substantive things to say out of all the Kurtzman era shows. You know, we can't just assume people are gonna keep doing the right thing a generation down the road. Maybe the dilithium shortage in Discovery Season 3 or the Romulan refugee crisis in Picard Season 1, but frankly I think both of those shows fumbled the bag. As I referenced earlier in this video, all the characters fit into specific niches. 
N niches. People are gonna give me shit about that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna leave. Going. I'm gonna leave that in. Yeah. Once again, Mariner fits what I've decided to call an anti-establishment archetype. Someone who believes in the fundamental mission of Starfleet, but is not as comfortable with the chain of command and all it entails. Contrast that with Michael Burnham, who has often been the voice of reason in a room full of war hawks, but whose characterization was, in my opinion, damaged by the decision to make her a human race on Vulcan. Sinequa Martin-Green is a fantastic actress, and I'm glad they let her open up in seasons 3 and 4, but early disco Michael Burnham suffers from what I like to call the Captain Marvel effect stiff and wooden. Tindy is, like I've said, someone who could effectively function as a mascot for the franchise at this point, as she embodies the optimistic spirit and scientific curiosity of the model Starfleet officer. And her storylines in Lower Decks have offered some of the best exploration of Orion culture in again, in my opinion, the entire franchise, fleshing them out from the pirates of yore to a more complex matriarchal society. Boimler moving away from trying to please everybody and figuring out what type of leader he wants to be is, I think, something a lot of people can relate to who are frustrated with authority structures as well. And Rutherford adapting to his new life through the trauma of his injury functions as a metaphor for humanity in the Star Trek universe, which has crafted a fairer, more just and empathetic society in the wake of the horrific World War III. Think I'm reading too much into this? Okay, maybe I am, but I think that Lower Deck's commentary on institutions is one of its biggest strengths. Also, Tindy's tits are huge. So where do I place Lower Decks in my ranking of all the Star Trek shows? Well, my top three shows are still Deep Space Nine, The Next Generation, and the original series. I haven't really done a rewatch of Voyager in a while, but based on the sole criterion of what is this show adding to the discourse, dare I say, I I'm going to put Lower Decks in fourth. That's right, not only ahead of Picard and Discovery, ahead of Strange New Worlds, but also ahead of Voyager and Enterprise, the latter of which I think had more potential if it had not been prematurely canceled. This might change over time, but it's how I feel right now. Rewatching Lower Decks for this video has gotten me all kinds of emotional. Sure, the jokes might not land for me all the time, but the characters are rich, the animation is smooth and vibrant, the score is swelling, and the storylines are getting better with each season. I'm glad it exists, and whereas I previously considered Lower Decks to be kind of a weak show with some strong moments, I now consider it to be a good show with some flaws. It engages in some of the most meaningful meta-commentary about Starfleet since Deep Space Nine, and the way it deconstructs other aspects of the universe, like Orion's stereotypes, makes it one of the most important additions to the canon, in my opinion, in decades. We might be past the golden age of television, but in addition to the ways that I think Lower Decks smartly subverts the traditional Trek formula, it's just a fun time. So here's to season five and all it may bring, and I have a perfect... <laughs> so, so here's to season five and all it may bring. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> With that, Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash orange river, link in the description, or become a YouTube member by clicking the join button on my channel page. And a huge shout out to Kinsey K, without whose help this video would literally have not been possible. By becoming a patron or member, you also get access to awesome perks like behind the scenes photos and videos, patron and member only polls, name in the credits, merch discounts, and more. Or you can drop a one-time super thanks or PayPal donation. All are appreciated. Links to my PayPal as well as my social media and merch store are in the description too. That's all I have for this week. Live long and prosper.
Oh, the, the bottle, that hurts so much. <laughs> uh, do it harder. <laughs> it hurts so good. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're an Orion, aren't you? Yeah, you Orion pirate scum. <laughs> oh, s smack me. <laughs> <laughs> I love being married to my husband. <laughs> Is it really a meme anymore, though? Not to mention, not not to mention the fact. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, Tyler from the future here again to let you know that if you enjoyed this video, I highly encourage you to check out the video on Lower Decks that Kinsey should have just uploaded on their channel. It should be coming out the same day as this. If you're a patron or member watching the extended cut of this video, it'll be the day after. That's right, $5 patrons and members and above get access to an extended uncensored cut of this video. Link to Kenzie's video should be in the description as well as probably in a pinned comment on YouTube. Go check it out.